Welcome to the Project Ascension Show. I'm your host, Mickey Huff. On today's program, we play for you a keynote speech for Independent Media Week that is held annually in Ashland, Oregon. This was a keynote talk from April 18th called Resist the Media, Fake News, Critical Reasoning, Sociology of Media, and the Influence of News as Propaganda. It's the 14th annual Independent Media Week talk that I gave in Ashland, Oregon last April. On today's program, we share that talk. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Project Censored Show. I'm your host, Mickey Huff. On today's program, we play a keynote lecture that I gave April 18th in Ashland, Oregon at Southern Oregon University. The talk was called Resist the Media. It was on fake news, critical reasoning, sociology of media, and the influence of news as propaganda. Ashland, Oregon's 14th annual Independent Media Week showcased a coalition of independent media producers, local activists, and community groups organized around the theme of a well-informed citizenry is a cornerstone of democracy. I gave the keynote lecture this past spring called Resist the Media. It was a two-hour talk with Q&A. On today's Project Censored show, we share with you that talk. I'll be riffing on themes from our recently released book, United States of Distraction, Media Manipulation and Post-Truth America and What We Can Do About It, as well as Censored 2019, Fighting the Fake News Invasion that I edited with Andy Lee Roth, and, of course, the newest censored book, 2020, Through the Looking Glass. We hope you enjoy this presentation. I want to start going back to the 1960s and 70s. I also just co-authored a book with a former student, now colleague of mine at Project Censored, Nolan Higdon. And to me, it's really an honor to be able to, well, I guess it's, it's an honor to have taught for almost 20 years, a privilege actually, but it's so wonderful to see some of the people that I've taught over the years come back and actually be peers and colleagues of mine. And the new book that I just finished with Nolan is called United States of Distraction. The United States of Distraction is an interesting title, and that's why I'm going back to the 50s and 60s here right now, is because I want to talk about that. The subtitle of that is Media Manipulation in Post-Truth America and What We Can Do About It. With that, I wanted to say that some of you may remember FCC chairperson Nicholas Johnson. Nick Johnson was in, in the FCC in the 60s and 70s, and when he came out, he wrote a really fascinating book called Your Second Priority. And what Johnson was referring to In fact, media scholar Robert McChesney wrote a lot about this, and I'm 48, and so my introduction to Johnson actually came through McChesney. And so McChesney had a really pointed insight about Johnson regarding why the state of journalism ought to be everyone's concern, noting that corporate news media are, quote, set up to maximize profit for a relative handful of large companies, end quote. McChesney went on to say, the system works well for them, but it's a disaster for the communication needs of a self-governing society. So if we want to change the content and logic of media, we have to change the system. As former Federal Communications Commissioner Nick Johnson likes to put it, whatever your first issue of concern, media had better be your second, because without change in the media, progress in your primary area is far less likely. So why the media is all of our concern and why free press protections are so important for all of us. And this is what Nick Johnson is getting at. There's some other things that are going on in the 60s and 70s that help get us where we are today. You know, Lao Tzu once wrote that if you're not careful, you'll wind up where you're heading. And if you go back into the 50s and 60s, particularly the early 70s and the Nixon years, uh, some of you will recall 
There was an earnest effort at the enclosure of the commons, the theft of the public sphere by private interests. And it's a very, very significant issue, and it's really at the core of some of our current challenges. James Buchanan, Milton Friedman, Grover Norquist, these characters, this is all by design. There's nothing accidental about the anemic state of our political discourse and media offerings today. This is all by design. So I want to go back a little bit more again in time to talk about what the impact, what this effect has been. And, and the overall theme here, of course, is not just resisting corporate media, but it's also talking about the significance of critical media literacy education and why, again, this is all of our business and something that we all really need to participate in if it's going to get anywhere. So just was combing around not long ago, and I happened to be reminded of a Carl Sagan quote from a book called Demon Haunted World, Science is a Candle in the Dark, back from 1995. And I'm starting here with 95. As an historian, I'm one of those weird people that hops around, visits this part and that, and connects dots. And the next thing you know, we're going to be back in the 1920s, and then we'll come back up here, and we'll fly around, and we don't even need a DeLorean to do it. At least people still get that joke, right? <laughs> but here's what Sagan had to say in 1995, and it's pretty interesting to me. Quote, I have a foreboding of an America in my children or grandchildren's time when the United States is a service and information economy when nearly all the manufacturing industries have slipped away to other countries, when awesome technological powers are in the hands of a very few, and no one representing the public interest can even grasp the issues, when the people have lost the ability to set their own agendas and knowledgeably question those in authority, when clutching our crystals and nervously consulting our horoscopes, our critical faculties in decline, unable to distinguish between what feels good and what's true, we slide, almost without noticing, back into superstition and darkness, the dumbing down of America is most evident in the slow decay of substantive content in the enormously influential media. The 30-second sound bites now down to 10 seconds or less. Lowest common denominator programming, credulous presentations on pseudoscience and superstition, but especially a kind of celebration of ignorance. Are we there yet? You know, in the 60s, Andy Warhol talk to us about everybody would have 15 minutes of fame. Now we're down to 280 characters on Twitter. This fleeting attention span is all part of this design. And in fact, it, this has become such an issue and topic of debate in, in social sciences, humanities, social psychology, etc. There's a whole field of study dedicated to this problem. Has anybody in here heard the field of study called agnotology? Anybody know agnotology? Strange word means the study of human ignorance and its impact on civilization. <laughs> Should be a bustling field, right? Robert Proctor down at Stanford is one of the few people doing it. There's a whole book about it, and I, I suggest you check it out if you want to see just where we have been heading. But from Sagan, I want to keep going back on our little history tour here. Of course, in 1985, going 10 years prior to that, we had Neil Postman, media ecology professor at New York University, and he wrote a, a fabulous book called Amusing Ourselves to Death. Right, again, are we there yet? This is, again, by way of saying, and again, if you want a little central thesis here, again, how we got here. We are here by design. We are in the era of fake news in a so-called post-truth America that uses alternative facts to buttress confirmation belief systems, where we have siloed partisan harangue which substitutes for actual public discourse. I want to go back earlier than that because I want to talk about Daniel Borston. How many people here remember Daniel J. Borston? Fantastic U.S. historian. It's interesting. There are not a lot of public intellectuals that are historians. My good friend Peter Kuznick at American University, along with Oliver Stone, authors of Untold History of the United States, their recent re-edition just came out with a 200-page new chapter. So it's, a new, it's, a, it's like an extra little book tacked on about the last seven years. Borston, of course, you all knew Howard Zinn, and there are certainly a few historians that were public intellectuals, but I like to see more of us, because I think history provides context for the present that is sorely lacking in a lot of the discourse we see today, even in intellectual settings. Borston wrote a fantastic book in 1962, among the many other books he wrote, but this was a rare occasion where a well-known historian was actually writing about what was going on around him in the present, and that book was called The Image a guide to pseudo-events in America. I was telling you earlier, by my age, I'm one of those people that's caught between various technologies. 
Good thing we do still have this old technology called books. This was Borston's book, The Image, A Guide to Pseudo-Events in America. What he was really talking about was how we were turning into, purposely, we were turning into really a vapid and superficial culture. But it wasn't just the corporate interests and the media and the political class that was deviously turning us into this. We were also asking for it collectively and societally. I don't like to read a lot of stuff when I do public talks. But in this case, there's some things that I think I want to read because this is in 1962. And I think that more significantly that I'm up here even talking about that, just listening to Borston in his own words in that time, he says, in this book, he describes a world of our making, how we have used our wealth, our literacy, our technology, and our progress to create a thicket of unreality which stands between us and the facts of life. I recount historical forces which have given us this unprecedented opportunity to deceive ourselves and to befog our experiences. Think about this whole cultural landscape of fake news and alternative facts and the post-truth world. These are all things that we have been hearing in the last several years, but again, I submit continuously, this is nothing new, and this has been a long time in the making. Of course, America, Borston says, has provided the landscape and has given us the resources and opportunity for this feat of national self-hypnosis, but each of us individually provides the market and the demand for the illusions which flood our experience. And we want, and we believe these illusions because we suffer from extravagant expectations. We expect too much of our world. Our expectations are extravagant in precise dictionary sense of the word, quote, going beyond the limits of reason or moderation. They are excessive. And he gives several examples about how we pick up the newspaper at breakfast. We expect, we even demand that it bring us momentous events since the night before. We turn on the car radio as we drive to work and expect news to have occurred since the morning newspaper went to press. Just think about the current examples of that on Twitter and Facebook, right? And you're like, smacking that button for the dopamine hit, you know, and you're just like, did someone like my thing yet? Or I texted you 10 seconds ago and I says you've received my message. Why haven't you gotten back to me? Instant gratification comes with its costs and consequences. And again, Borston goes on and on about this, and I won't read that segment to you. But he goes on to say, we expect anything and everything. We expect the contradictory and impossible. We expect compact cars which are spacious, luxurious cars that are economical. We expect to be rich and charitable, powerful and merciful, active and reflective, kind and competitive. We expect to be inspired by mediocre appeals for excellence. To be, I won't make any asides about university-driven pathways and all this other top-down management gimmickry coming out of the corporate management schools, but you can just imagine what that looks like nowadays. We expect to be inspired by media appeals for excellence to be made literate by illiterate appeals for literacy. We expect to eat and stay thin, to be constantly on the move and ever more neighborly, to go to church of our choice and yet feel its guiding power over us, to revere God and to be God. Never have people been more the masters of their environment, yet never has a people felt more deceived and disappointed, for never has a people expected so much more than the world could offer. By harboring, nourishing, and ever enlarging our extravagant expectations, we create the demand for the illusions with which we deceive ourselves and which we pay others to make to deceive us. 1962. So, the story of the making of our illusions, the news behind the news, has become the most appealing news of the world, and Project Censored found that in 1976 by Carl Jensen, the purpose was to discuss the news that doesn't make the news and analyze why. I focus a lot on Borston and illusions because some of you may be familiar with Chris Hedges, Empire of Illusion, Death of a Liberal Class. I mean, without these people that I've just mentioned, Chris Hedges wouldn't have a book career. I don't say that disparagingly, but I mean, Hedges has done a pretty good job of reminding us who a lot of these people are and were, which is what I'm doing here. This is my 10th Project Censored book. I'm doing the 11th. I just finished the United States of Distraction book. I have a Global Critical Media Literacy Educator Resource Guide, which you can find at gcml.org. You can download it for free. It's a 120-page critical media literacy guide with all kind of resources in it, right? So this is what we try to do, the antidote to fake news. We'll get into some of that more in a little bit. The reason that I go back in history and I talk about these other people and these ideas is because in the last couple of years, so many people have contacted us at Project Censored and said, what's going on? What's fake news? What do we need? How is this happening? 
And you say, well, that's interesting because we've been studying this for a long time. In fact, we've been studying it for so long, it wasn't called fake news. It was just called propaganda <laughs> or misinformation or disinformation. And so I'm glad that people are now a little more attuned to this. And one of the things that we've seen is declining trust in all of our civic institutions, which is not, not a good thing at all. But during this decline, and again, I'm going to go back to that in a minute because it's been by design, a lot of people have been turning off media and turning off corporate media because they don't know what to trust. Another part of this is because we don't have enough of a vibrant free press that everybody can get their hands on these kinds of sources. I mean, they could if they went online and they looked for it, but we live in that great culture of convenience. We go home, we hit the red button, the screen comes on, tells us what's going on. We even have different versions of it. We have the Fox News for conservatives, we have the MSNBC for liberals, we have CNN for whatever sort of is smashed in between some of that. And Quite honestly, that's such a myopic right-center uh, sphere that also really shows part of the problem when you zoom out of it with a critical media literacy lens. So I'm going to go back a little further. Of course, we'd be heavily remiss to not mention our friend George Orwell in 1984. And uh, there's some very interesting lessons, not just on surveillance society, but on who controls the present, controls the past, who controls the past, controls the future. Today's fake news is tomorrow's fake history. So notice how we loop ourselves around. These are very significant things. So we are very grateful to previous people who have attuned us to what we face. And many people were warning us that this was going on. It's just not everybody was always listening. I'm going to go back further than Orwell and, of course, our good friend Aldous Huxley, whom Neil Postman thought we ended up a lot more like in Brave New World, loving our servitude through our desires, and we create our own prisons in our own minds. Coupled with Orwell, it makes for a nasty dystopian mixture in the present. But I'm going to go a little bit before even Aldous Huxley to someone that I think who has had more of an influence on our fake news dilemma and 21st century propaganda than any of these. These other folks were trying to warn us about it. This guy was telling the elites how to do it, and his name was Edward Bernays. Many of you may recall Edward Bernays, the nephew of Sigmund Freud. Bernays lived a long life. He lived to be over 100 years old. And he spent a lot of time with his uncle. He spent a lot of time you know, learning about psychology, learning kind of what made people tick. And Bernays, I think, and again, this is another area where it's like it's easier to just read you a, a brief passage because not only is it spot on in terms of how public relations works and manipulates public opinion, but Bernays went on, of course, to write a book called Propaganda in 1928. And if you don't know it, it's a short little book, but if you don't know it, you should really check it out because not only does it describe how to control and manipulate populations in a democratic republic, it argues that this is how we ought to be running modern democratic states. Later, of course, people like Edward Herman and Noam Chomsky took Bernays to task in the book called Manufacturing Consent, which is one of the terms that came out of the World War I period with Bernays and journalist Walter Lippmann as well as George Creel from the Creel Commission, who ran the first government propaganda agency officially called the Committee for Public Information. And the purpose of it was to whip up support for World War I in a largely docile, pacifistic population that didn't want to get involved in the European war. But in chapter one of that book called Propaganda, this is obviously before propaganda became a dirty word. And of course, we like to blame the Soviets and the Nazis for trashing propaganda as a term and a tactic. What few people seem to recall, however, is it was Eddie Bernays that was one of Goebbels' best teachers. You know, the Nazis based their entire propaganda campaign off of people like Eddie Bernays, and so did the Soviets. And of course, here in the U.S., we've never veered from Bernays' propaganda. We've just become more and more sophisticated about it. And now we even do it digitally with bots, algorithms, sock puppets. Not only are these people you never see, they're now things you never see or even heard of or can technologically understand. Here's Bernays in 1928. Chapter one of that book is called Organizing Chaos. Very honest man was Eddie Bernays, strange to say. But he was very honest about what he was doing. And he was arrogant enough that he believed he was right. And what he was proposing was just and proper and patriotic. Remember that these people truly believe that they're doing the right thing. They believe they're doing God's work. I'm now sort of riffing on providence for manifest destiny, right? That kind of business. Organizing chaos, chapter one, quote, the conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in democratic society. 
Okay, so we can, can we see where Bernays ideology is coming from here in sentence one? The conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in democratic society. Those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society, Bernays, constitute an invisible government which is the true ruling power of our country. We are governs, our minds molded, our tastes formed, our ideas suggested largely by men we have never heard of. In writing in 1928, it was men, for the most part. This is the logical result of the way in which our democratic society is organized. Vast numbers of human beings must cooperate in this manner if they are to live together as a smoothly functioning society. He said again, whether the attitude one chooses towards this condition, he said, it remains a fact that in almost every act of our daily lives, whether in the sphere of politics or business, in our social conduct or our ethical thinking, we are dominated by the relatively small number of persons, a trifling fraction at our 100, then 120 million, now 320 million, who understand the mental processes and social patterns of the masses. It is they who pull the wires which control the public mind. He's telling you straight up who controls the agenda. And look, the agenda can have the miniaturized, shrunken down right-left paradigm or dynamic where you can wildly debate in the little myopic circle and say, gee, look, we've heard from the right, we've heard from the left, we've heard from the Republicans, we've heard from the Democrats. Whatever in the world else could there be? Well, as we know, a lot. An awful lot, in fact. But Bernays even went further about the commodification of political culture. He went on to say, in theory, everybody buys the best and cheapest commodities offered on the market. In practice, if everyone went around pricing and chemically tasting before purchasing the dozens of soaps and fabrics or brands of bread which are for sale, economic life would be hopelessly jammed. To avoid such confusion, society consents to have its choice narrowed to ideas and objects brought to it attention through propaganda of all kinds. There is consequently a vast and continuous effort going on to capture our minds in the interest of some policy or commodity or idea. We must find a way to make free competition function with reasonable smoothness. He believes that competition is what makes this all go around. He says to achieve this, society has consented to permit free competition to be organized by leadership and propaganda. Don't take my word for it. Go read him in black and white. He's telling you that riff on a little Hamilton here without Broadway. Americans are too stupid and ignorant to govern their own affairs. Therefore, the smart elite people need to help them figure it out. So it's not in Iraq 2002, 3. Do we go to war in Iraq? It's when will we go to war in Iraq? Or when will the UN basically say we can go to war in Iraq? It's a frame. And when it turns out that the weapons of mass destruction are weapons of mass deception, we just kind of turn the page and we move to the next thing. And, you know, again, Bernays warned us about this. Oh, by the way, who sold us that war? Who sold us the Iraq war? John Rendon, the Rendon Group, one of the biggest PR organizations in the United States. Who sold us the first Gulf War? Hill and Knowlton, one of the biggest PR firms in the United States that trained the Kuwaiti ambassador's daughter, Naira, to lie to Congress about Iraqi guard throwing babies out of incubators, which never happened. I mean, this is age old. And you know, these people are so, let's put it this way, they're not necessarily clever, but they don't need to be in a lot of ways because they see something that has worked historically and they're like, well, look, why reinvent the wheel? In World War I, it was Eddie Bernays and the Creel Commission that were talking about the Germans ripping the arms off of Belgian babies. It was them telling you, you got to fight them over there so you don't have to fight them over here. And we even had a song, over there. Well, what do we say when we came in there at 9-11? we got to fight them over there so we don't have to fight them over here. I mean, they just recycle this propaganda and appeals to our emotion. I mean, if anybody was even a modest student of history, this stuff would have red flags all over it. All over it. And you'd see it marching down the square and you'd be like, <laughs> here comes the nonsense machine. But we don't collectively as a society. Many of us cower. Many of us say, oh, they're out to get us. 
Right? Fear and hope are the great levers. And we certainly see them all the time. Whether it's hope and change, or make America great again, or morning in America, right? Fill in the blanks. Right? Or we've got to get the terrorists, we've got to fight the, we've got to fight the evil doers because they hate our freedom. Look, can you distill it anymore? Can it get any more dumbed down? Can it get any more less specific? Well, again, the more vague we have these kind of political communications, the easier it is to pull the wool over everyone's eyes because it means something different to everyone hearing it. This is the brilliance of this kind of propaganda. And Bernays said, we need more, not less. And so with Bernays, how are we seeing the Bernays of our own day? Well, I mentioned several of these groups already. And what we see now is we actually have a name for some of this stuff, but it's interesting because fake news, while being propaganda in itself, the whole concept of fake news has now been weaponized. And so it can be used against anything with which someone disagrees. So you come and you say, oh, I have this information about this, and well, that's fake news. And remember, let's, let's remember that the rise of fake news in its current iteration took place coming out of the 2016 election, the 2016 election cycle, and that's something that we should, we should definitely not forget because the Democrats were originally wielding that out of the DNC when they were blaming the, the possibility of Russian interference in the election. And they were saying that Putin is trying to undermine the electorate and send fake messages and he's working with Trump. I mean, here we are several years later and we're just now seeing a redacted version of this investigation from Mueller. In fact, we're not even seeing it, right, because it is redacted. But what Mueller said was that he couldn't prove collusion. But it didn't take long before the corporate media began picking up on this fake news moniker. And then, of course, the brilliant showman, the brilliant con man, the brilliant brander of nothing, Donald Trump, made a whole career of this. That was just handed to him on a silver platter. Said, you're fake news. These people talking this way, the Washington Post, New York Times, his favorite target, Jim Acosta at CNN, before he was even inaugurated, pointed over the podium at Jim Acosta and said, CNN, you're fake news. I mean, again, these people just gave him this glorious gift that never ends, the confirmation bias defense mechanism. If you don't agree with something, it's not true. I'm right, you're wrong, no matter what. Of course, anybody who's been watching Roger Ailes and Fox News since the mid-90s knows that that was their modus operandi. And they just kept moving it around. And of course, you can't out Fox Fox, but CNN and MSNBC have certainly tried. For the last couple of years, I don't think Rachel Maddow has bothered to see anything outside of Russiagate. There's been very little reporting other than what media scholars refer to as pre-mediation. In media theory, pre-mediation is the ever-present fixation on something in the future that hasn't technically happened yet that we don't technically know, but we're going to continually spin our wheels in the present and speculate about what we think it means now, even though we technically don't know what it means now because the information isn't available yet. But man, is it raking the viewers. And you know, after Bill Barr, the Attorney General, who was appointed to help try to cover this up, why do we know that? Well, because this is the same Bill Barr that helped cover up Iran-Contra in the 80s. This is the same Bill Barr that was in the CIA in the 70s when George Herbert Walker Bush was there. This is the same Bill Barr that tried to trash the records of the Church Committee so we wouldn't know about COINTELPRO and we wouldn't know about CIA dirty deeds overseas. This is the same Bill Barr. How many times are you going to trot these ghouls out? And you're just going to sit there like a man of integrity, the Attorney General, and just rubber stamp. Oh, there's nothing to see here, people, nothing to see. When somebody like Bill Barr says there's nothing to see, we need to see it. <laughs> we need to see it. And I'm not even suggesting that when we see it, it'll mean Putin and, and Trump are buddies and they planned it all along and whatever. I don't know because I haven't seen it yet. I'm not going to engage in pre-mediation. We have a right to see all, every single bit of that information, all of it. We had a right for the church committee to keep going, but man, they stopped like 10% in. And Frank Church was told by the powers that be, this investigation is neat, serving an interesting purpose after Watergate, but I think you're done. In other words, you see a little peek behind the curtain and the show's over. <laughs> we got business to do, right? And we did have business to do. And Reagan came in and started doing it again. And that's when we went right back to the secret dirty wars of the CIA and right back to COINTELPRO. We called them different things, of course. We just went right back to that morning in America. And in fact, a number of years ago, 
William Casey is who it was, the director of the CIA, 1981, who, when coming out of one of the early meetings with Reagan, said, quote, we'll know our disinformation program is complete when everything the American public believes is false. Are we there yet? You're listening to the Project Censored Show. I'm your host, Mickey Huff. On today's program, we're listening to a talk that I gave as a keynote lecture for Independent Media Week in Ashland, Oregon at Southern Oregon University. Special thanks to the community radio station there, KSKQ, Jason Houck, and Wes Brain, as well as Kathleen Gamer Hogstrom. After this brief break, we'll continue that lecture, Resist the Media. Stay with us. CIA disinformation campaigns are fake news on purpose. The CIA history goes way back through to the Washington Post, the New York Times. At one point in the 70s when the church committee came out, 76, 77, Woodward Bernstein. Carl Bernstein wrote an expose in Rolling Stone that talked about, quote, 400 journalists working as assets for the CIA. What we later learned is there were actually thousands over the years. We've seen interns in newsrooms as recently as 10, 15 years ago at CNN, right? And CNN gets caught saying, like, well, we had some interns from the CIA working in the newsroom. Is there a problem with that? Yeah. So this whole enterprise that Bernays kicks off of disinformation is all about control. It's about controlling public opinion, controlling public debate. In authoritarian cultures, they do it with violence. Well, the United States does it with violence too. We have a very violent external foreign policy. We also have a pretty violent internal police state. I'm not gonna say that it's the magnitude of some other countries around the world, but it's there and it's real and it's not a relative game where it says like, well, it's not Saudi Arabia, so we're cool. If that's the bar that low, then we probably should start asking other questions about the direction humanity has been heading. And hey, it's not all gloom and doom. I'm getting to some good things here. But it's important to talk about now what are the more recent manifestations of propaganda. And one of the biggest things that we've seen in the last 10 years is the splash in of social media. Facebook in particular, now Twitter, Instagram. Just like we have six companies that do 90% of the media, corporate media here, we've got a big five in the tech sector, whether it's Google, Amazon, and they tend to own each other or own stock in each other, much like the corporate media has over the years. Again, I don't know how much you all are familiar with what's been going on with social media control, but Facebook in particular last year began deplatforming over a thousand people and organizations' pages after they sent up the big trial balloon. So some of you may not remember that before the Facebook purge took place, censoring many of, and again, these were libertarian sites, they were socialist sites, they were outside of that myopic bubble where Republicans and Democrats get to play like they're, they're part of the broad political system, but they're actually the myopic right center. Facebook sent up this trial balloon before they deplatformed anybody, and they went after Alex Jones at InfoWars. Easy target, the guy might as well have a bullseye on him. I've known about Jones' work for nearly 20 years, and there have been a few stories over the years where he was on to something. Naturally, he eventually spins it into a ditch, and it turns into a disaster, and he poisons the well for anybody that wants to seriously study and discuss it. But they started deplatforming him, and you know there wasn't a lot of outcry about it. In fact, not only was there not a lot of outcry, there was a lot of celebration. There was a collective applause from Republicans and Democrats alike. That they're just like, yay, the loony guy has now left the building. Right? Except right after that, what happened, and, and again, whether you like Jones or not is immaterial, the guy had a huge following, had monetized his version of propaganda under the guise of Infowars, etc. In his court cases of late, whether it's divorce or now, the, the, the people over at Newtown can sue him. That's an interesting development because among the more lunatic things that Jones has said over the years is that nobody died at Sandy Hook and with harassing parents and so forth there. But during some of his trial for his divorce and so on, his own attorney said, look, the guy's been a performance artist for years. The way that it's gotten through social media and platformed on the internet, it allows people to sort of digest it and just sort of say like, yeah, this is what's really going on. See, again, this is part of a mass disinformation campaign. And I don't know that Jones is a provocateur. 
or an entertainer or a yellow journalist. I don't know. What I do know is that he seems to suck up a lot of air in a room. And when Facebook went after somebody that had a huge following and they saw applause, that was the move. Then it was like, here's a list of 800 other sites. That was quick. Did you have that ready already? Yeah. I mean, this has been a design. This has been a plan again. And now, again, this is the behest of Congress. This is the behest of Congress with telecom lobbies saying, like, look, we've got to clean up the fake news problem from the last election. You remember, they bring the tech people in, the Zuckerbergs, the others, they dog and pony show them in front of the Congress. People in Congress don't even know what Facebook is, half of them. They don't necessarily even know the tech questions to ask these people. And Zuckerberg's like, well, Facebook's my toy. It's my business. It's my creation. And I take credit for it. And I'm going to go clean this up for you guys because I don't want to be regulated. He has since now trying to change his mind on that, but this is going back into two years. And so he said, well, we'll get on that. And so what did Facebook do? What has Twitter done? They started deplatforming people. Notice who they're deplatforming. It's not just Alex Jones. They tried to deplatform people like Dave Lindor for a counterpunch. They've deplatformed Antimedia. They've gone after Mint Press News. Congress itself went after Abby Mark long after she was even gone from RT and quit of her own accord. She wrote the intro to our new book, Fighting the Fake News Invasion, and she recounts her story of how the Senate Intelligence Committee names her by name for being partially responsible for Clinton's loss that she won for a show that had been off the air for three years. And so, <laughs> you knew Russia was coming back, right? The specter of Russia was coming back. So under the guise of fighting fake news, but it's only Russia that does fake news in the United States or marginalized ones. If it's far libertarian or far left, right or left, right, that's, that gets pushed out to the sides. But the major corporate media that actively engage in false reporting or misleading reporting, that's called, quote, mainstream media. We don't really get to then question that moniker that they've made for themselves. There's nothing mainstream about six corporations that control 90% of this. We're the mainstream, us. But under the guise then of fighting fake news, Zuckerberg then is going after these, these Russian-backed sites. So this is where CNN comes in. CNN, and this was a story broken by Kevin Gostola of Shadowproof, who works with Rania Kalik. And Kalik is overseas now, and she has a few programs on what's called Mafic Media. And Mafic Media on their site, one of their funders is Russia, is the Russian government. By the way, if you wanted to start and go and look and see how many media outlets that the United States government sinks money into or the BBC sinks money into or others, it's a thing. All countries are involved in this. And in fact, Mafic, they weren't even hiding it. But CNN went after it because they saw Kalik and Kalik had a connection with RT, Russia Today. So they tried to say that, what's she reporting? What, anybody, anybody here know Rania Kalik and her reporting? Anybody? Recently, one of the things that she's been doing and reporting about was Venezuela. Interesting how that at the same time the United States government is crowing about how Russia is interfering in our elections, we're having a slow motion coup d'etat in Venezuela. The second try this century so far, the second formal official one that we know of. But Kalik is calling out the propaganda that's spewing from the Washington Post, Republican and Democratic parties, the New York Times, CNN, across the spectrum. This isn't to say that Maduro is the perfect leader. This isn't to say that there aren't problems in Venezuelan politics, but they're Venezuelan politics. They don't need our input on what they're supposed to be doing. And yet here we see Trump and here we see this administration saying, well, this guy's a dictator. He's an authoritarian. What's, man, if you're using that word for Maduro, how do you talk about the Saudi royals that Trump has no problem hanging out with or Brazil? Bolsonaro, etc. I mean, I wonder what the terms they save for these people. Maduro, whether you like him or not, is, is not a dictator. He was elected by the Venezuelan people. Um, Max Blumenthal, another journalist, actually went to Venezuela to several of the major cities and into several of the major neighborhoods and checked out all the grocery stores and markets and interviewed a lot of people because one of the big claims was that Maduro was stopping foreign aid from coming in and the people of Venezuela were starving. Well, look, some people in Venezuela, like every other country in the world, including this one, are starving, right? It is a problem. But under the regime change banner, the New York Times is crowing about how all this is happening. So Blumenthal went down there. People like Rania Kalek are reporting about this stuff, saying like the New York Times is lying. They're only telling you part of the story and then they're exaggerating about the rest. CNN was one of my favorites. CNN was, we're covering what's happening. We're covering the great protests. Look at the protests against Maduro. Meanwhile, they'd have tons and tons of other activist work going on of hundreds of thousands of people on the streets. 
that supported Maduro. Right, but they never talked about that. They only talked about the anti-Maduro protest. And CNN even admitted, they said, we're embedded with the anti-Maduro protesters. Okay, at least you're admitting your bias now. <laughs> right? But no, at CNN, they thought it gave them more credibility. We're embedded with the anti-Maduro protesters and they're showing just how corrupt this regime is. It's pretty amazing. New York Times even had to retract a couple of their stories. That's how bad this was. It was such rank propaganda that they were called out on it, that they had to say that, no, okay, well, we, maybe we were exaggerating that story. Maybe that wasn't exactly what was going on. Well, I mean, why in the hell should we be trusting the New York Times on matters of regime change? You remember Judy Miller? Weapons of mass destruction? Ahmed Chalabi, the guy who was convicted of extortion and had to escape Jordan in the trunk of a car that was a CIA asset, getting hundreds of thousands of taxpayer money, feeding Judy Miller at the New York Times the line of the weapons of mass destruction that didn't exist because he was one of the people on the top five list to take over Iraq after we potentially toppled Hussein. Yeah, that story. Judy Miller. New York Times. I could go on all, all day about this nonsense, but I won't. And I have a couple other things that I want to talk about that are things that we can do about all of this and what you can do. And part of our role in that at Project Censored of fighting the fake news invasion is going out and factually vetting some of the best independent alternative journalists that we have, not only in this country, but around the world, that do shine lights in dark places and help us understand what's happening. As George Seldes in the 20th century said, the great George Seldes said, journalism's job isn't to be objective, right, with false equivalencies, and here's an expert on the climate crisis, and here's an expert climate scientist, and here's 90-some percent of them saying that we're in big trouble. Over here is a paid shill from ExxonMobil that works at the Heartland Institute saying, eh, I don't know if that's true. Let's give them equal time for a decade. Seldy said, journalism's job is to tell the people what's really going on. And that's what these journalists in, in, that we highlight and honor every year do. One more thing I do want to put on your radar if you're not familiar with it, watch out. Because now, under the guise of fighting fake news, a lot of these big tech platforms, have, they've wisened to this. Right? And they're seeing now that it's like, well, the same problem that many of them are helping to create, it's kind of like the medical profession and big pharma. If you're not sick yet, they'll help you get there. And then they'll help treat and mask the symptoms. Well, here we have the same problem with the Trojan horse tech companies. Under the guise of fighting fake news, they're now offering censorship as a solution. Back to Bernays. We'll tell you what the news sources are that you can trust. And then you can vibrantly argue inside that little myopic circle. But NewsGuard, anybody here know NewsGuard? Well, they're embedding themselves in a lot of browsers. They're working with Google, Facebook. Um, they're going to have a little shield on your web. If you download the NewsGuard browser, you can look at it, and it'll have a green shield, because green means good and go. Then it'll have a yellow one. Hmm, not sure about this source. And then, of course, you know what's next. Communist red. The red shield is evil propaganda and fake news. So some of the sites that are on their way to getting the Red Shield are Counterpunch and Mint Press News and the old muckrakers and new muckrakers that are calling out the influence of capitalism and on all of our institutions. Did I say capitalism? Yeah, it did take me a while to get around to saying it. But that's of course what's at the heart or behind most all of these designs for maximization of profits. And I bring that up because, I don't know if you saw in the interview with the lead editor of the New York Times last year, in an interview was talking about how the New York Times was proud that they didn't have a bias, that they were an objective source. <laughs> we can laugh, we'll laugh our way through that momentarily. But what they said in the next paragraph was that they were a decidedly pro-capitalist newspaper. And I'm like going back, I'm just getting out the dictionary. You're an objective source, you're an unbiased source, but we're a pro-capitalist, we're a pro-capitalist newspaper. Well, thanks. Thanks for admitting that, you know, in case we missed it somewhere. But it's fascinating that this is part of the problem. These people do not necessarily see themselves as biased at all. Because they're all swimming in the same sea and they're all swimming in the same direction. So anything that seems to be going another direction is obviously wrong and biased because they're set objectively true north. And that's again back to Bernays. That's part of how when you control the frame itself, those who control the frame can frame themselves out of it into invisibility. 
And those are the people who are pulling the wires of the public mind. And we need to see more exposés, more call-outs, and more attention being paid to these people and their agendas. And my very good friend and professional mentor, Dr. Peter Phillips, previous director of Project Censored, tells you who those 300 and some odd people are in his new book, Giants, the Global Power Elite. Names the names, names all the top funding places, hedge funds, where they put their money. We even have a letter signed by 90 people, 90 scholars and activists in the back of the book to them saying, you can't take it with you. I know you and Elon Musk are trying to go to Mars because, you know, you made a mess of things here, didn't you? And you conned us into helping you for a lot of it so we could get scraps while the earth burns. Dar Jamal's new book, it's not a happy read, The End of Ice, but you got to read it. I know I'm talking to people who already probably read it. But the thing is, is that that's why I did this. This is the United States of Distraction book. But this book is written for people that are in their mid-late teens, early 20s. I mean, it's for any age of people that maybe don't know some of the things that I've been talking about here today. We have become an increasingly illiterate society in terms of civics, media and free press issues. That's why I started all this with Sagan. And then we went back from there. And Nick Johnson. This is all of our business. This is all of our challenge to overcome. The problem is, is that we have been turned into passive spectators, Daniel Boriston, because we kind of, kind of liked it a little bit. Some of us, it worked out in our lifestyle. Work all day, work hard, come home, I got to reward myself with a little junk food news or a little infotainment. And again, we all have our guilty pleasures. But if we really don't focus on the significance of local journalism and investigative journalism that has been completely gutted since the Fairness Doctrine died in 1987 and since Clinton's 1996 Telecom Act further paved the way for deregulation, so now we're down to a handful of companies. Remember Ben Bigdicki, and I forgot to mention him in 1982, former dean of UC Berkeley, journalism graduate school, wrote Media Monopoly seven editions later. He was the canary in the coal mine in 1982 saying, man, we've only got 50 companies running the media, we're doomed. I mean, Bigdicki died a few years ago. We dedicated a, a book to him, but my goodness, something that he probably wished he was wrong about. And again, this is why I, I go back and forth, is that we have been on this path for a long time. And now that we have this whole fake news, fake debate going on, it's preventing people from really, again, peering behind the curtain to see what it means. Again, like the Washington Post that was crying about fake news of Trump in 2016 in December, right after the election, right after, right after they reported that the Russians allegedly hacked the Vermont power station. Never happened, never happened, never happened. Took them a couple days to admit it never happened, and they actually got called out by that beacon of investigative leftist journalism, Forbes magazine who even called them out on their own crap reporting, right? But they handed it to Trump on a silver platter, and he goes, see that? Fake news. And Margaret Sullivan, who was there at the time as one of the media writers, was like, I think it's time to retire the term fake news. And I just said, why don't we just retire the practice? Why don't we start there, and then the term will follow? <laughs> These are the challenges we face, and now it's let us back to a very dangerous trend that we've seen in our history, where the press is the enemy of the people. And in fact, if we go back in our history with this kind of rhetoric, the Lugenpresse, back to World War I and II, the lying press. And the German government used that against any critical media, any critical journalism of the day. Hitler used it to round up journalists and silence voices and shut things down. Here we now see Trump saying that we should be able to shut down a comedy show on a corporate news network, one that used to be owned by the major military industrial complex giant GE. Saturday Night Live. The war on the press is real, and you remember back in the 70s, say so yeah, I'm coming back and forth, because I mentioned James Buchanan, I mentioned Grover Norquist, who wanted to shrink government down to the size we can drown it in a bathtub. Are we there yet? What we're seeing right now, and Noam Chomsky talks about this too, and it's interesting, because we were talking about this in the book, United States of Distraction, 
And he said it's almost as if, again, that this is being done on purpose. Trump is over here with Twitter. He's distracting you here. He's distracting you there. And meanwhile, the Paul Ryans, the Mitch McConnells, they're just mowing down the New Deal, mowing down the Great Society. Betsy DeVos has got a controlled demolition of the Department of Education going on before our very eyes. This is what these people have been dreaming about for decades, and they're doing it, and we're letting them while we fight about fake news. This is by design. This is not to be mistaken with media criticism. We're a media criticism organization. We believe media of all sorts should be criticized. We like to be criticized constructively so that we learn. How do you make a better press? How do you make journalism better? How do you make education better? Well, you don't just take Bill Gates' money and let them decide. And ditto in journalism. You don't just go and, well, maybe if we ask CNN, they'll do a better job. As Ralph Nader often says, Nader, in one of the many things he's done with us over the years, one of the things he wrote about us is that well, if every newsroom in this country had a copy of Project Censor's annual book sitting around, there'd be no slow news days. 24-7, you don't have to fill it up with garbage. You could just go right through here. And our students research these stories, and they vet these stories, and we work on these. So we teach them while we're doing it how to do it, how to be a critical thinker, telling people how to think, teaching them how to think, not telling them what to think but giving them the tools. And what are the tools? The tools are critical media literacy, education, and critical thinking with a social justice pedagogy that works on helping raise the bar for all of us. And these are the things that we try to teach. So out of this war on the press, we should be demanding that not only that we stop this kind of seriously hostile authoritarian rhetoric, but again, more importantly, we stopped the practice of demonizing the press. And actually, we took some guff for this at Project Censored because when Jim Acosta at CNN lost his press credentials, Andy Lee Roth and I wrote in defense of the press. And again, people are saying, how could you defend Jim Acosta? And I'm saying, you're totally missing the point. If they can do this there, then it paves the way to do it anywhere. I don't know Jim Acosta personally. I don't know what maybe goes on in his mind. I know what goes on with corporate media and the propaganda model. That I know. Ownership, advertising, elite sourcing. Chuck Todd over at Meet the Press even bemoaned aloud that he said, you know, if I ask my guests the tough questions, they won't come on my show anymore. He said it out loud in an interview. Well, dude, did you ever read Chomsky and Herman? <laughs> did you study the propaganda model ever in school when you were becoming this millionaire journalist? You know, you got to start to wonder, anytime somebody is a millionaire, as a journalist, you got to start asking what in the hell they're doing. Because I bet you they're not doing muckraking investigative journalism. Because the pool of money at the top is not really shelling out for a lot of that. Now granted, I'm not saying that the Times and the Post and even the cable networks don't ever do any good reporting. They certainly do some decent reporting on various topics. But they just as consistently produce propaganda, miss and disinformation, conceal their biases, all the while calling out biases elsewhere. The CNN Mafic Media story was the doozy I started telling you when they were going after Rania Kalek and found out that Russia partially funded them, claimed that they lied about it. The Mafic video people that Gostola wrote about said, no, we didn't lie. We actually told you about it and pointed it to you on the website. Basically, CNN started the story, and they made it into their own story. So they basically manufactured a story about a crisis that they created. And then they went to Facebook and said, do you know that you're platforming sites with Russian funds? Over at Facebook, where they had that ever-sensitive kind of moment, we're saying, oh, yeah, we're trying to put the kibosh on the Russian propaganda on Facebook. Yeah, but they're not worried about any of the other propaganda, apparently. Only propaganda comes from Russia. Only Russia meddles with elections. Yeah, ask Boris Yeltsin about that one, where Clinton was meddling in theirs. So the thing with Mafic then went is that Facebook, at the behest of CNN, took down all their sites, took down all their pages. Ten days later, with mass protests, Facebook put it back up. They put the pages back up. But notice, the, notice what's happening here. You can have major corporate media going to the big tech sector say, and say like, hey, you, you watching this? We need to flag state-funded media. I'm like, okay, let's, let's flag it then. Let's start with NPR. Let's start with PBS, BBC. I mean, are you going to flag all of it? And the folks at Fairness and Accuracy and Reporting picked up on this right away. 
And they're just like, so which state media should we be allowed to see and not see? And then they listed a whole bunch of US-backed media programs that are nothing but pro-NATO propaganda. Oh, did I say pro-NATO? One of the Facebook fact checkers for fake news is the Atlantic Council, which is the PR wing of NATO. Again, I mean, you can't even make this up. Which is why the next book we're doing, Censor 2020, is called Through the Looking Glass. And Alice will be invited. This is why we have to resist censorship, resist bots, algorithms, Trojan horses, even legislation. There's dozens of states that are now either passing or considering media literacy bills. Oh, good, 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 good. No. They're not critical media literacy bills. They're media literacy that the big tech sector is sucking up with groups like NewsGuard. NewsGuard claims to be a media literacy tool, but they're clearly not. They're trying to winnow and they're trying to buttress their own establishment status quo propaganda, pretending that they are fighting against fake news. Has media literacy been hijacked? The answer is yes, it already has. And so these companies know where to go, they have the money to do it, and they're banking and betting that not enough of us are going to notice. I disagree. You know, we're doing as much as we can with our little tiny five-figure budget organization. So what I ask people to do is like, well, can you help us? Meaning, helping us is just like, what are you doing and how can we help you? How can I have you on our radio show when it's on at 50 stations? How can I get our films to you? How can I give our books to you? How can I give you our curriculum for free to give to your friends or teachers or wherever? That's what we're here for. We're here to help each other. It's a community effort. We can't do it alone. Especially, we need numbers because we don't have dollars. We've got smarts. We've got know-how. We've got grit. We've got gumption. We've got spines. We've got vision. We've got all that. And probably most importantly, what we have that that the big money and interest don't, is we have love. Love for humanity, love for each other, love for the earth. That's something that's sorely missing in our media and in our culture and in our education is empathy and understanding others. And very quickly on the way out, here's some basic things that we try to impart. We subscribe to the Society of Professional Journalists Code of Ethics, number one, right? That's something that we do and we believe is very important. Four simple things. Seek truth and report it. Minimize harm. Act independently. And be accountable and transparent. Is it that hard? Supporting human conditions, not free market propaganda and corrupt politicians. Cause they own by special interest groups that fund their campaign. You're listening to The Project Censored Show. This is your host, Mickey Huff. On today's program, you've been listening to a talk I gave called Resist the Media for Independent Media Week last April at Southern Oregon University. To learn more, go to projectcensored.org. Special thanks to the Rogue Independent Media Center for making the event possible in conjunction with KSKU Community Radio. Wars, fall for little boys in the weather's manufactured paper, why tax them on the bridges.